So he's visited, uh, he's having a, a sabbatical at Yale Divinity School. And he is uh, visiting and we've asked him to come and give a, a couple of lectures here. And you would find that in my talking to you, I will use the expression Christianity in Africa more than African Christianity. Um, we say African Christianity out of convenience. Mm. But generally, um, it's Christianity in Africa because uh, we don't have uh, a different type of Christ. We believe in ancestors, believe in smaller deities, a sense of community, the inseparability between the sacred and the secular, and so on. And Christianity had to literally insert Christ into this culture of how Christ interprets the religious traditions that we have. Kwame Bediako taught me as a seminarian sometime in 1984. And, but it was just around that time and in his subsequent writings that he drew our attention to a book written by a British Episcopal missionary who said in East, East Africa. He's never give you that quotation. I'd like you to listen very carefully to J.B. Taylor. Christ has been presented as the answer to the questions a white man would ask. The solution to the needs that Western man would feel the savior of the world, of the European world view. The object of the adoration and prayer of historic Christendom. But if Christ were to appear as the answer to the question that Africans are asking, what would he look like? In our writings, we have responded to this question in many ways. Because our idea was to tell the story of Christianity from an African perspective and to see how Christ would look like, I suggest that we take a close look at the sort of emphasis that the African initiated churches gave to the gospel. Mm -hmm. So if you want to understand African-initiated Christianity, this is the area you look at. They go to the historic mission churches. They say, oh, once you are a Christian, you are protected by Christ. But the people are suffering. So from the early 20th century, is when there was almost like a complete rebellion against historic mission Christianity. And that led to the formation of what we call African-initiated churches. And they became um, the representatives of what Africans are looking for in Christianity. Hmm. So one scholar, uh, Christian J. Baita, he's a Ghanaian, he says that the African initiated churches are a demonstration of what the African when left to himself considers important in Christianity. And what does the African consider important in Christianity? Christianity must respond to existential issues. the daily issues of life, the practical issues of life. Because these were the things that took people to the shrine. You cannot discourage the average African from believing that evil is real. If you want to understand why a stream of Christianity like Pentecostalism mm. has become important in Africa, because it's because of its ability to take the supernatural seriously. Mm -hmm. Exorcism, 
healing, deliverance, the prophetic. Because within the African context, divination is very important. It is through divination that you are able to discern what is happening in the supernatural realm. So if you have a religion that is not able to divine, then you have a problem. Normally in my own ministry as an African pastor, I have come to realize that they are emphasizing a certain reality that I need to engage with myself. So what I'm telling you is not just book. You will find some of it in the book. <laughs> but it's also experiential. So we moved from the historic mission, Christianity, Methodist, Presbyterian, Anglican, and so on, to African-initiated Christianity at the beginning of the 20th century, led by serious indigenous prophets. In West Africa, we had Prophet William Wadi Harris. His story is told in a fine book by David Shank. The title of the book is William Wadi Harris, The Black Elijah of West Africa. In the Niger Delta area in Nigeria, we had a prophet called Garik Sokari Braid. His story is told by Lamin Sane in his book, West African Christianity and Religious Impact. And Garik Sokari Braid was so powerful and charismatic that when he spoke, people received his words as filled with supernatural power. And in South Africa, there was a prophet called Azar Shembe. Then in Central Africa, there was Simon Kimbangu. His story is told in a book by Marie Louis Martin. The title is Simon Kimbangu, an African prophet in his church. And as a shameless story is told in a book titled Bantu Prophets of South Africa. And all these prophets emerged between 1906 and 1920. They took the whole matter of spirit possession seriously. That the Holy Spirit can come upon people, possess them, and use them. They took healing as religious practice seriously. They took prophetism seriously. And worship in a typical African independent church was very expressive, very informal. These sometimes people argue as if it is the Pentecostals who came later, who introduced drumming and dancing into African churches. It's never true. It's never true. It is the African-initiated churches that introduced African drums. He's the Christ who deals with the demonic. He's the Christ who is gender sensitive. Because these churches recognize women. 100 years before John's church. Then I talk about their very dynamic pneumatology, the experience and power of the Holy Spirit as part of the Christian life. Then I talk about their oral theological discourse, the composition of local choruses, for example, a move away from the Western hymnody. Oral theology is very much a part of the African initiated uh, Christian discourse. Then I talk about their innovative gender ideology. That these were the churches that started affirming the inclusivity of women. Christianity in Africa has come a very long way. We are still struggling. There are still struggles. I mean, there's no question about that. But then I think that by taking their destiny into their own hands, and expressing a certain type, expressing Christianity in a certain way, these churches, these churches open their eyes.